Oh, that one. <laughs> you know what it is? It's a reminder. I can look down at that and say, wow, that's in a time of weakness. I actually let somebody else convince me that that's what I was, you know? So now I can, you know, it's, now it's a constant reminder, you know, never to let anybody have that much power, that much control over the, you know, over the thoughts of myself, you know? I mean, for a while, I was like, oh, it's a warning, you know, stay away, you know. <laughs> but that was just kind of, you know, in reality, that's what it is. In a moment of weakness, I actually let somebody, another human being, convince me that I was unlovable. In 1982, my brother was diagnosed with HIV, and I remember going with my brother to shooting galleries, and as we walked in, on the table was a glass jar, a clear jar, and it was full of syringes. The water was already pinkish red, and I remember people knocking on the door, and they could rent a syringe and just go and, you know, inject and come back and put that needle right back into the jar, and um, someone else would come and knock on the door, and rent the same syringe and reuse it. I remember when I was about six years old, I was in my house, my mom was in the house and my aunt, and there's the phone rings. And my mom started screaming. And we didn't know what happened, so what happened? Um, I knew something happened and it was really bad and didn't know what it was. Well, they found one of my relatives in an abandoned building on Pitt Street and he had died of an overdose and they found him like three days later. So uh, that also brings it really close to me because I know that until even now this, these things are still happening. Me he dado cuenta que en toda el área, yo vivo en el área de, de tercera, en el área del Bronx, y estoy viendo adictos curándose en las esquinas de los bloques detrás de los carros, en parking la, al lado de escuela de niños y dejando sus jeringuillas ahí. Muchos de esa gente son pacientes de HIV. Cualquier niño puede pullarse, cualquier persona adulta sin querer, porque lo hacen hasta el lado de los parques, que eso es parte del gobierno, que eso es para que todo el mundo disfrute. So, yo creo y pienso que es, hay que buscar una solución. Si el adicto no quiere dejar entonces la adicción, pues hacer como un centro en el cual esos adictos puedan ir ahí y con jeringuillas nuevas y con su alcohol, sus cosas, curarse botar la jeringuilla, botar todo y salir limpio para la calle, así evitamos también los arrestos por, por posesiones de droga en la calle y que evitamos que la, la gente caiga más preso por ese problema. Well, for me, as a young person, it was initially my bedroom. That was probably the safest place I've ever injected. Um, honestly, it was home. Uh, but as my addiction progressed, of course, it led me to much less safer environments. This event happened, actually it was a nice day, and I was with a friend of mine who hasn't been around for a while, and we went, we copped a few bags of dope, and I said mm -hmm. to him, I said, listen, dude, you know, you know, you haven't done nothing for a while, so, you know, just do freaking, you know, a test shot mm -hmm. and see what's going to happen before you want to, you know, just go what, what you usually do. Of course, he wasn't trying to understand. He wasn't going for that one. You know, so we walked a couple of blocks. We got into a park where people usually go and get off at. Earlier in my use, I would 
I mean, it would be good if you could find a bathroom someplace warm with lighting and you could sit down on a flat surface and use the sink in the bathroom to get everything together. I mean, that was a good day. Um, quite often it was just in the car. We'd find some place that we could park the car and, and just shoot up. And car washes was a common place, um, parking lots. Um, but sometimes that, that wasn't a choice. I, I once shot up while driving down the interstate using the seatbelt to tie myself off and cruise control. Because um, you'll shoot up wherever you have to. I mixed up one bag for him. He did it. And he was okay. You know, and then he looked at me. He's like, can you please just mix up another bag for me? I just want to do another bag. And I looked at him, I was like, are you sure you really want to do that? My phone rang and I was on the phone and I'm talking on the phone and when I turned back around, he was on the ground. There's many times in my life where I've, where I'd gone out and just drove, driven someplace because I couldn't necessarily get high at my house and I didn't have anywhere else to go. I couldn't continue to go to the same McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts that we'd go to every single time because they start to identify who you are and what you're doing and they don't want you there. So I would just drive off someplace in the middle of nowhere where nobody's gonna find me if I overdose. And I think that's probably pretty common. So harm reduction is an approach that many of us in the substance use field take to working with people who are using drugs. And it overall reflects an approach that seeks to meet the person where they're at, to find out what's going on with that person, and to identify uh, different strategies or different approaches, different steps they can take to protect their own health and reduce their risk of both social and health consequences from the drug use. We're right here now on 124th Street, Lexington Avenue. This is one of the parks where most of our individuals that receive our services come and inject because they don't have a safe place to inject. Most of the individuals are homeless. So this is like one of the parks that we come into and look for dirty syringes that may be left over from people that are being used. So as you can see, I'm sitting here on this bench. And to put myself in the place of individuals that's using, I'm sitting here using, but this is not, even though it's a little secluded off the main street, there's still a lot of traffic that comes through here. You know, and for me to sit here and to take a chance to inject, I could be interrupted, the police could come by, the kids could be coming into the park, residencies of these buildings may be walking by, and it's not a good look. You know what I'm saying? It's not safe. Public injection is a public health issue, both for the injector as well for the community that the injector lives in. For the injector, it could mean um, botched injection, which could mean um, soft tissue injury. It could mean um, discarded syringes in a place where you wouldn't want to see discarded syringes. So it's also a, an issue for the, for the community around there. It could mean that the injector has an overdose and there's no one there to respond. So it's issue upon issue tied into public injection. I wasn't always homeless, but I am now. My godfather died about a year and a half ago. And so since then, yeah, definitely I have nowhere to, well now I, I use vocal, but before that I had nowhere to go. You know, hallways, the park, streets, bathrooms, whatever you could find. It's very hard to focus on keeping yourself safe um, and reducing consequences of drug use, whether it's reducing your drug use or making sure you're, you're using in the, sa the safest possible way when you don't have a safe or, or stable place to live. After a while, after, you, you know, after you're addicted for a long time, since we're not, you know, we're not professional doctors, we're not nurses, a lot of these guys, they don't know how to shoot up properly. Like myself, I didn't know how to shoot up properly, so I was getting, I was, I was getting a lot of abscesses. I was hitting nerves. I was hitting uh, tendons, you know, and I didn't understand because I, I was not educated. I didn't understand what, what was going on. I've had, you know, uh, you know, tons of, <laughs> uh, you know, issues, you know, from you know injections. I've gotten, you know, endocarditis. You know, I actually I got 
uh, osteomyelitis, you know, and everything, you know, all from, you know, from injection. And, you know, 90% of that would have been, would have been alleviated, would have been avoidable if I was able to, you know, if I had access to, you know, clean, you know, you know, you know, cleaner, you know, cleaner materials. It's not like when they lock you up, they're like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> you were just doing that because you had nowhere else to go. It's an easy mark besides, you're an easy target. You know, they don't want to expose their family or their kids to that, so they end up going the street where they feel that, you know, if um, they go maybe in an abandoned building, you know, nobody, nobody in their right mind is going to go sleep in an abandoned building, you know, or go shoot up in an abandoned building. So they figure they go in there, nobody's going to see them, you know what I'm saying? They're not going to be around the people that probably know their kids or their parents or whatever, and they, so they get that little moment of privacy there to do that even though they might be afraid, scared, that somebody might go in there and, 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 and rob them or hurt them, you know? I know they don't feel safe in there, because I know I didn't feel safe. I think you have public injection wherever you have injectors. It's, again, folks don't choose to be public injectors. I think that if they had a place to go where they wouldn't be harassed by police or uh, open to public view, they would do that. I'm originally from Long Island. You know, I moved up to Greene County when I was pretty young. Um, went to high school in Greenville. You know, real, real small town, country living. Um, you know, not a whole lot to do. Everyone just kind of partying and hanging out. You know, um, it was you know fun place to grow up, but probably not you know the best place for me because it's where I started a lot of my partying um, you know I started uh, started getting into prescription painkillers when I lived out there you know pretty much all the work is like physical labor kind of stuff you know um, so you know you're just working hard you just kind of want to relax afterwards eat a couple of painkillers you know it's just kind of what everyone was doing um, then kind of before we knew it, heroin kind of exploded. for stuff here because it's stuff the caps and stuff. You know we like to try and get everything off the ground so keep it as clean as possible. Yeah so this space I mean it's very close to where the van is um, and people literally come from the van to here to, to shoot up. I mean we're about maybe 20 feet from the van if that um, and you know with a certain periods of time during the summer here, for instance, this has been full of syringes back here. Um, th then it suddenly gets quiet and then moves over to the other side of the van. So this area around here, there is usually people are using right here. Outside of New York City, some of the issues are the same for a lot of our participants and the people that we serve. And then there are some things that are unique in that you know, we serve large geographic areas here. So we have urban centers, you know, like Albany, Schenectady, Troy, and then they're surrounded by suburban and then very rural areas. And so the patterns of use and the patterns of folks traveling tend to be a, maybe a little different in that um, if you live in one of those rural areas, you need a vehicle in order to get into access services. Uh, into access harm reduction, into certainly to find and, and purchase drugs. The three or four people who, you know, we were all real close and kind of looked out for each other and, you know, we would take the trips to go pick up together and, you know, to use together. 
you know, you go pick up and pull pull into some dark alley maybe, you know, and shoot up and kind of try to hide while you're doing it. Sometimes while you're driving down the road, you know, shooting up or, you know, maybe even try to find some bathroom somewhere, you know. Fast food restaurants and, and public restrooms are places where, where people will use. But also we have people who inject in the woods. And, you know, that's not just in the woods in, in rural areas. That's the woods right off of main drags in the in the urban setting. It was crazy. Um, you know, we'd be going out going out in the woods to use. I mean, I remember, you know, not having water or anything and just using like creek water to, you know, shoot up with, you know, not knowing <laughs> what the heck is in it. You know, we used to joke about getting like beaver fever or something, you know, shooting up with the creek water. Um, but uh, yeah. So some of our some of our people that are living in, in an area like this, um, if you wanted to sort of avoid attention or law enforcement, uh, or if you didn't have a safe place to, to inject on your own, you know, you can duck into an area like this. Or obviously at least you'll be out of view. But you know, again, there's a there's a mouse running around down here. Um, there's uh, there's a bunch of litter. Uh, Again, not a great environment for uh, for a safe injection, especially if you're sort of hurrying and worrying about about attracting attention to yourself. Fear, lots of fear, panic, even to finish, of course, injecting, and then to get out of there as soon as you can. And I mean, that fear is we've I've been in situations numerous times where we're in a moving vehicle and the people in the car are getting are getting high, they're shooting up because it's safest to be on the move and to not get caught but it's really the most dangerous you know every once in a while someone would go to the pharmacy and get a pack of needles that we would share and we'd use them until they were jagged and rusty and I mean I remember having bruises just up and down my arms you know from using the same needles over and over and you'd have to twist and turn it to get it in and you know it's just awful. It was awful. And like, you know, we, you, you hear about sharing needles, how, you know, you can get hep C and this and that. But I mean, we never heard about how, you know, sharing, sharing water or just the works, you know, we, we were never informed on stuff like that. Um, you know, so coming here and learning that stuff, I mean, you know, it's, it's been great and it, it makes me want to go back home, you know, to Greene County and to that area and kind of like spread the news, you know. Just the isolation and being alone, at least in more densely populated areas, the chance somebody's going to stumble upon you is greater. If you're in an alley in a city, somebody eventually is going to see you lying there. If you're on a back dirt road in the country, no one's going to find you. And, and that's just the reality of what it's like to be in a suburban or rural area and be injecting. You know, so I tried to get him, I'm, I'm smacking him, I'm smacking him, and he's not freaking, he's not coherent, you know, so I, I went to what I know best, you know, I gave him a, a, a breast rub, he still wasn't coming out of it, you know. So then I went to my bag and I didn't have my Narcon kit. So I got on the phone and I called the corner project and Hector answered the phone and I told him that what was going on and I need someone down here immediately with a Narcon kit. And then I called, after I got off the phone, then I called 911. It was the point of who was gonna get there first with me. The corner project came and administered the Narcon. I think it was I was just, I think it was just one shot that got him back to normal and, and he was okay. When I got your call, I felt like I had a sense of where you guys would be, um, but I knew that I had to sort of enter the park and just give it my best shot to, to assume where you were, right? Um, so when I came in here, I just remember shouting, like, it's Sarah from Corner Project. Um, and, and just like sort of following my gut, 
down to this spot right here. I mean, I honestly believe if I was with somebody else, I would have died that day. Yeah. You know, I mean, Rock, he's he's great. I've known him for years now, and he's helped me out with a lot of things. And you know, I always try to do the best to do something in return for him. And it just, you know, I know a few people that it didn't turn out the way that you know he came out. You know, where everything was okay. Was though there wasn't anyone there. You know, and they were really out of the place. You know, and you know there was no phone. There was nobody even helped them. Actually, a lot of people think that this is safe because of the fact is the police are not going to see you. The place that we are right now is a place where a lot of people come and inject now because they don't have you know a secure place to go into. They don't want to go into their parents' house. They don't want to go into their girlfriend's house, and they don't want to be around you know people that know what they're doing. So this is what we got. You know, this is what we got. We got the freaking park. Our programs early on tried to do things like put in black lights or other things in bathrooms that would make it less likely that someone would choose to inject there but then they're just really putting the person back out on the street and they're going to find another place to inject that's probably even worse. So inch exchange programs are helping people who are active drug users and in those cases walking the line between keeping participants safe, keeping facilities safe, um, com adhering to the law which is that it, using drugs in the facilities is, is not okay yet also acknowledging that it, that it can and does happen is the line as a public health person that we're all facing. So I realize that people are using in vocal, at vocal. Uh, they use our bathroom and they take their time and you know, eventually we, fi we, write, we find wrappers to a syringe in the garbage can. And since that is the norm that people have to find a safe place to, to be able to use, so what we do, we need to make it safer. So we put a sharps container. So if someone is using, they're encouraged to throw that in, uh, syringe into the sharps container and clean up after themselves. And the truth is that people don't want to get sick. People don't want to die of an overdose. People just want to be able to function. And functioning is, is being straight. So if they're able to take care of themselves, they're able to be responsible. We, you know, we want people to be responsible, but we don't give them the place to be responsible at. We do have programs that have taken a lead on that and exploring ways of making their own facilities safer for injection. So for instance, having a buzz lock on the door so that if someone's in there, they're not gonna be locked in. If there's an overdose situation, somebody can get in. To have an intercom so that if someone needs help, they can ask for help. Are you okay in there? Are you okay in there? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Having timers so that it's clear how long somebody's been in there. So if they're in there too long, they could be asked what's going on. Um, to provide, obviously it's syringe exchange, um, syringe exchange programs, all the materials that somebody needs to inject safely are there. There are people there who are trained overdose responders. So there are all kinds of things that would make it, um, make it work and some of the programs have set up like clean stainless steel tables. Obviously a bathroom isn't the best place to inject whether it's in Burger King or at a syringe exchange program, but some of what we've seen are, are look looks like it, it's, it's the best alternative that we have right now. And, you know, just having everything that you need and for it to be clean and sterile and all that makes a difference. Having it available, mo people are going to use it. You know, I've been to bathrooms of harm reduction organizations and I've been to injection sites in many parts of the world and they're really not the same thing and I think that's important for people to understand. Mm -hmm. The big difference is that in a supervised injection site it's not hidden, it's legal. It's not just tolerated, it's legal to be there and to be injecting drugs. And so once you make that the baseline a whole bunch of other things can happen including the person can relax and feel like, like legitimate um, and can open up and can start building a relationship with the staff that can't happen otherwise, where you can talk about your healthcare needs, your housing needs, your legal needs, and all a whole bunch of other things that unfold out of that 
therapeutic relationship that can't happen in a bathroom. My name's Nick, I'm the peer coordinator at Washington Heights Corner Project. Uh, prior to this I was a health education officer uh, at the Sydney Medically Supervised Injecting Centre. A supervised injecting facility is a place where people can go and inject drugs uh, in front of health professionals. Um, it provides a clean environment for them to do so and it provides a space for health professionals to engage with people. I moved here three and a half years ago from Vancouver, um, where I was involved in harm reduction there. The thing that we didn't have until it opened um, in 2003 was a safe place for people to go to inject. Having the needle is one thing, but having a safe place to inject is another thing. Um, and that was the gap that Insight filled. People were dying, and they were people who used drugs, and they were people's mothers and daughters and brothers and sisters and that the problem had been ignored for too long. What I'm seeing here is what was happening prior to the injecting room opening in Sydney. Um, there's a lot more used needles lying on the street in New York. Prior to the injecting room opening we would find approximately 150 needles out the front every morning. Uh, these days, if they found one or two, that would be considered a busy day. Really, on a very practical level, if you are able to actually go up to somebody in their booth and show them in real time how to inject themselves safely, you, you know, the, the level of intimacy and therefore efficacy of the education is way better. Insight did not lead to increased crime, it did not lead to more drug users moving to Vancouver to take advantage of this service. Nobody is dying from using drugs at Insight. Nobody is contracting or transmitting HIV or Hepatitis C. Abscesses and resultant hospitalizations are uh, decreased. So that's a significant public health impact in and of itself. But on top of that, people that use Insight and it's not like we're pushing people to go to detox, but people that use Insight are twice as likely to follow up and try to access um, detox services than people who don't. Now where I'm working, um, people do inject in the bathroom, um, but we never see that. Once the door closes, that also closes opportunities as health workers. If we don't come up with a plan, we're gonna lose a lot of human life. We know what happens if we ignore public injection because it's already happening and it has been happening for years, right? So what happens is people die of overdoses, which is totally unnecessary. People inject in unsafe conditions. People uh, contract and transmit infectious diseases. People get abscesses. Um, people also get robbed and you know, attacked and assaulted in unsafe conditions where this is happening. I mean, you don't feel comfortable going to your small town doctor and asking him for information. I mean, there's, there's nowhere to go, you know? I learned from the drug addicts that turned me onto it, you know? And they learned from the drug addicts who turned them onto it, you know? There's, there's nowhere to go. Well, they come in here, they have a cup of coffee, they could go in the bathroom, you know what I'm saying? Nobody bothers them, they safe, nobody's gonna, you know, hurt them. You know, they could rest, if they tired, they ain't gonna run for three, four, five days, they could get their thoughts back together, you know? And then maybe they lucky, they could hear a group, and they could say, wow, that could be me, man. I, maybe I could go to welfare and get my Medicaid, you know? Maybe I could go to detox 
and get my life together. Maybe I could get cleaned out. You know, maybe I could be that guy. That guy used drugs for 30 years. And look at him, he's clean, he got a job. Maybe I could do that. Maybe I could be, you know, understand? So yes, we need, I believe, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that we need a lot of places like this, more places like this. I think that system of care, whether it's delivered in special addiction treatment settings, whether it's delivered in harm reduction settings, whether it's delivered in primary care settings, is important to think about the menu of choices and the continuum of care that's available. So when a person is looking for help, is interested in receiving help, that help is available and it's effective wherever the person chooses to show up. We want to keep people healthy, healthy, healthy. That's really important because when that person decides to stop, we want them to be able to continue to move on with a healthy life. I was a 17-year-old girl with no hope for a future. I had resigned to the fact that I was going to live and die a drug addict, and that was it for me. At just 17, you know, I was so alone and isolated um, and, and just lost. And all it took was people believing in me, you know, little, little pieces at a time, people showing me that I, I might just be worth a little bit more than that. Today, I am the program officer of an organization called Young People in Recovery, and we support all pathways to recovery, and we get to help young people discover their potential in life. How recovery and harm reduction work together is that even with harm reduction, that's just how you enter into the process of discovering recovery and, and venturing into recovery. Harm reduction is a really trauma-informed approach to giving the person, the individual who's suffering, who's had so much taken from them, so much hope, so much freedom, so much safety taken from them in their life and in, in their active addiction. Harm reduction is a way to give them control over choosing when they feel comfortable and safe enough to try something different, to try to find themselves again. Because when we try to force people into abstinence and, and just stopping because we've decided it's time for them to stop. We're just traumatizing them over again and we're taking, we're robbing them of their freedom and their safety. So when we introduce ways like, you know, safe injection sites and, and, and harm reduction methods, we're allowing them to guide us. We're allowing the individual to pick and choose the time when they're safe and they're comfortable and they trust us enough to try to change their own life. That's what all of this work is for, is to provide people with just a little taste of dignity, because that taste of dignity can grow into an entire appetite for self-care.